Our topic for this session is structural equation modeling. And uh, I want to um, give sort of a brief overview um, of structural equation modeling um, in terms of how it relates to regular regression and correlation. Uh, we're going to talk about path analysis uh, and uh, the um, uh, concept of latent variables. Um, that's uh, really key to structural equation modeling. And there's two different uh, aspects of SCM that we'll talk about. One is uh, the measurement model and then the structural model. And so the measurement model will talk about confirmatory factor analysis. And then I'm going to uh, go through some uh, real life examples of confirmatory factor analysis and then uh, structural equation modeling. And then I want to end up uh, just mentioning briefly um, generalized structural equation modeling, uh, which uh, applies to uh, data other than um, continuous normally distributed data, um, as well as uh, random effects variables. So um, to review linear regression, um, we have a, uh, outcome that's as continuous and normally distributed, although um, it doesn't have to be exactly normally distributed. And so we have uh, the regression equation, which is um, the variables, uh, the covariates uh, in our model times a regression coefficient, uh, the betas, which are a change in the outcome for every unit change in um, the uh, covariates. And if we have a multiple um, uh, linear equation, um, then the betas are adjusted for all other uh, variables in the model. And so in the uh, context of structural equation modeling, we're going to um, uh, identify this as the structural model. So in uh, regression, um, most uh, often, uh, in fact, you'll hardly ever see it mentioned is that uh, it's assumed that the variables are measured without error. Um, and, and that's true for some variables like uh, survival, uh, either dead or alive, uh, age, um, we can say, and in other examples, we can say are measured without error. Um, outcomes like, say, stroke or myocardial infarction. Um, would appear to be measured without error, but um, that's not entirely true. Uh, and in trials where that's the uh, outcome or an outcome of interest, um, you typically have uh, a team of experts that adjudicates uh, the outcome and determines yes or no, whether it's a stroke or MI or whatever other outcome might be um, similar to that. However, when it comes to uh, patient reported outcomes, like the SF36 or the Seattle Angina questionnaire, the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire, um, those sorts of outcomes uh, are not error-free uh, when we measure them. And uh, we're going to uh, look at that. Uh, and in, in the context of structural uh, modeling, structural equation modeling, we're going to uh, take that uh, measurement error into account. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, what's called or referred to as path analysis. And basically, this is regression in a, a structural equation modeling or SEM framework. And so this is the path analysis is really a structural model. Um, the outcome and the covariates are all observed variables. Um, but often um, the uh, covariates uh, or our predictor variables are correlated. And then also we're going to look at whether our covariates are moderating variables or whether they're mediating variables. And uh, this is um, easily identified in the uh, SE, SEM framework of, of regression. So here's um, <clears throat> just a kind of an I'm, example I made up. So let's say that our outcome is uh, some performance score on um, 
uh, b being administrator, how well you would do it as administrator. And let's say that the variables that we want to look at that uh, predict um, <clears throat> the performance score are, score are age, sex, and income. So the way that we diagram this path analysis is that we have our covariates or our predictor variables um, that uh, we think influence the uh, performance score. And that's indicated by um, the uh, single arrow, one directional uh, arrows. But we might also uh, think that, well, maybe some of these are correlated. Like we might say that uh, income and age are correlated. And we might say that sex and income are correlated. Um, we wouldn't uh, necessarily think there's a correlation between age and sex. Um, there might be, but we're not going to suggest uh, in this case that there is. The only correlated variables we're going to look at are age and income and sex and income. And so in this uh, uh, path uh, analysis, we're going to estimate um, several coefficients here. And so what we are um, saying by our diagram here is that we have uh, two moderating variables, uh, age um, by income and sex by income. So those are in, if we were to express this as a regression equation, we would have age plus sex plus income plus age by income and, uh, and sex by income. So we'd have two um, interactions uh, in, our, in our model here. And so we're going to estimate um, the regression coefficients for each of our um, <clears throat> covariates uh, indicated by the beta coefficients. And then we're going to indicate uh, or estimate two correlations here, row one and row two, the correlation between age and income and between uh, sex and income. And so the way that we have this diagram, because we have the connection here um, between income and age um, and both uh, influence performance, then we have uh, indicated that, that we're looking for an age by income um, interaction. And then the same thing uh, with sex and income that we're indicating that we, because they're correlated um, and then both are influencing uh, the performance score that we have a sex by income interaction. So here's uh, an example uh, with some actual coefficients in there. So in this case, um, our outcome variable is burnout. It's uh, measured by an instrument called the ProQual. Um, and so we have three variables here that we think influence uh, burnout. Um, the first is demands of the job, uh, age, and then uh, support. Uh, and this is, um, this is actually in the context of a teacher wellness study and so this support here indicates uh, school support. Um, in other words, um, teacher support from within the um, uh, educational institution. So we can see here that we've indicated that we have a correlation between job demands and age, and between age and support, and between support and job demands. So we're uh, positing here that we're going to have three interactions, um, demands by support, demands by age, and age by support. And so what we have uh, then uh, on our um, regression lines here um, are the, in this case, these are standardized coefficients. So we see that we have a fairly large positive um, impact of job demands on burnout, in other words, uh, higher the demand, the job demands, the um, higher the score on our burnout uh, questionnaire. Um, we can see that um, age has a small um, inf uh, in influence 
um, but it's in a negative direction, which means that uh, with increasing age, the more uh, the less likely uh, the teacher is to experience burnout. And the same thing with support, uh, which is a, a larger relationship here, uh, that the more support you have, the less likely you are to experience burnout. And so we might look at our model here, and these are um, the coefficients that we would get from suggesting that there's interactions between um, demands and age, demands and support, and age and support. And we might look at this and, and um, say that, well, the correlation between demands and age doesn't look very high. So it may be that we could take uh, out the relationship here between uh, demands and age uh, and then see if we get the, the same um, uh, the same model that's as, uh, as, uh, as good as this one. And then the, um, the epsilon over here, this is the error. Uh, so, so this is actually the reliability coefficient of our uh, burnout um, variable. And so this is the sort of thing that we're going to look at um, when we do structural equation modeling um, or we do regression from a structural equation modeling uh, what we may get. And then when we do structural equation uh, modeling, uh, we're going to add in uh, what's called latent variables um, in addition to observed variables. So um, in the previous um, slide, uh, we looked at um, the uh, variables age, sex, and income and looked at uh, a model that had the interaction between um, sex and income and age and income. But let's say that we think that age is a moder is a mediating variable. That is, it doesn't directly affect the uh, performance score, but it uh, affects income and income uh, and sex then are the variables that influence the performance score. And so we would have, in this case, uh, a mediating uh, predictor variable where uh, age is influencing income, but age is not directly influencing, um, it is mediating income, but it's uh, income that's actually um, affecting the uh, performance score. And so we would have, in this case, uh, the regression coefficient between age and income, between sex, and performance score in between income and um, performance score. And then our one correlation would be between uh, sex and income. We're still uh, suggesting that there's an interaction between sex and income um, on performance score. So when we um, talk about structural equation modeling, basically we're combining structural modeling with measurement modeling. And the structural modeling we've sort of, we've already looked at where it's, that's the sort of typical regression equation. Um, and that's what a path analysis is, is basically a, a structural model um, looking at uh, regression from a, a SEM point of view. Then our measurement model uh, is where we create a latent, what we call a latent variable and this latent variable is created from observed variables. Um, so the latent variable is um, an, another way we would uh, define that as an unobservable or an unobserved variable. And so there are some common um, um, instruments that uh, illustrate this, a uh, common one that that probably you've heard of or actually had experience with the SF36, or uh, I think now uh, most everybody uses an SF12. They reduce the number of variables uh, that you have to uh, respond to, but uh, the variables in the, um, um, in the instrument make up different domains. Uh, there's a physical domain, an emotional domain, uh, emotional domain, and, um, and there's some others, uh, and then you get a total score out of it. 
Um, the Seattle Engine Questionnaire, which is um, used uh, in um, uh, cardiac patients with acute coronary syndromes, uh, has um, physical limitation, engine instability, engine frequency, treatment satisfaction, disease perception. Um, and so these domains uh, are the unobserved uh, variables or the latent variables. And then there's several um, or maybe many variables that, that go to um, uh, make up uh, that un uh, the unobserved variable. And then the same thing is true of the uh, KCCQ. Um, there's a symptom score, a physical function, a quality of life, a social limitation score. Uh, so those are examples of um, patient reported outcomes or, or questionnaires uh, where we have um, latent variables or unobserved variables. So uh, the um, best way to I think um, get a handle on uh, SEM is, is to um, just look at the is to look at the diagrams uh, that uh, that we make uh, from uh, our observed variables and then how we get our uh, latent variables or unobserved variables from that. And so when we um, draw our diagrams, uh, rectangles or squares are going to represent observed variables. Uh, ovals are going to represent latent variables. Uh, and then um, the single directional arrow, arrow, uh, arrows are going to um, indicate either regression coefficients or in um, factor analysis terms, factor loadings, which will uh, indicate by lambda. And then the double arrows, uh, double sided arrows, are going to indicate correlations. And then the circle. Uh, 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 with a single directional arrow, arrow is going to indicate the error variance uh, in, our, in our measurement model. So here's an example uh, of, a, of the measurement model. And when we uh, construct the measurement model, we're doing what's called confirmatory factor analysis. And so you can see that um, we have five observed variables here. And um, there's measurement error associated with each one. That's what the epsilons indicate here. And then we're um, hypothesizing that these five variables make up uh, a latent variable or an unobserved variable. And I'll give some of the example of this a bit later on. So the parameters that we're going to estimate here in our uh, confirmatory factor analysis are uh, the, the uh, lambdas, or if you're familiar with, fa <clears throat> with factor analysis, the factor, factor loadings. Um, we're going to estimate the error variances here. And then we might think that, well, some of these observed variables are related. So we might suggest that there's going to be some correlations here that we're going to need to estimate. And so um, there might be say three correlations here between uh, variable one and two, between two and four and between four and five. Okay. So when we do uh, our <clears throat> modeling here, obviously the thing we want to look at is how well does our measurement model actually uh, work or how does it, how well does it fit the data? And so there's several indices that we're going to look at that um, indicate how well our model is doing. And uh, one that we'll look at is what's called the likelihood ratio. And that's basically just a chi-square with degrees of freedom equal to the number of parameters we're going to estimate here. And then we get a p-value with that. Um, then we're going to look at what's called the root mean square of approximation, uh, the comparative fit index, and then uh, what's called the standardized root mean square residual. And then finally, uh, and a real important one, is the reliability index. In other words, how, how reliable is 
uh, the measurement of our latent variable here. So let me uh, give an actual example of this. Um, so, uh, oh, so, so first I need to um, um, actually define what these evaluation statistics look at or are doing. And so the likelihood ratio is, um, as, as, and maybe if you're familiar with um, logistic regression, this is also used in that as well. And basically, this is answering the question, how well does our model reproduce the data or the covariance matrix? In other words, the intercorrelations between the variables. And so what we're looking for here in terms of model fit is a non-significant p-value. Uh, so if this p-value turns out to be small uh, or statistically significant, uh, whatever you set that at, at say uh, 0.05, uh, if it's if it's less than that, then that means we don't actually have a very good fit. And ideally, what we'd like to see is a chi-square that's equal to its degrees of freedom. Um, you obviously never see the ideal, but we'd like to see the chi-square close to the degrees of freedom. Uh, the root mean square error is um, just uh, a, another way of looking at uh, the the error, and so. Uh, this is defined as the square root of the chi-square minus degrees of freedom divided by n minus one divided by uh, the degrees of freedom. Um, n minus one being the number of patients that you have uh, or the number of subjects in your um, confirmatory factors analysis. And so what we're looking for here is a small number uh, and sort of the typical cutoff uh, that's, that's, and again, this is just arbitrary, but it's sort of suggested as something less than 0.05. And then the comparative fit index is one minus uh, the model chi-square minus its degrees of freedom divided by a model without uh, the um, covariates in it. And in this case, uh, the larger, uh, the better. And so we'd like to see something for the CFI a 0.9 or greater, uh, 0.95 is um, usually considered um, uh, sort of the excellent um, fit index. And then the SRMR is a residual error variance. And uh, generally speaking, this, this is um, the smaller the better, but it also depends on the average correlation of the variables. So if, for example, the uh, um, error is 0 0.05, but, if, but the average correlation is 0 0.04, then that's really not all that good. Um, on the other hand, if the average correlation was 0 0.6 or 0.5 or you know, something like that, then um, the SRMR of 0.05 would be really, really good. So that's uh, somewhat less informative, but generally you want something small. And then the reliability index, which is just the sum of the factor loading squared uh, divided by uh, the sum of the factor loading squared plus the error uh, variances. And so this is sort of typical of reliability indices where we'd like it to be at least 0.7 or greater, uh, preferably um, you know, 0.8 uh, or greater. So uh, these are the... Um, evaluation statistics that we'll look at when we um, uh, construct our model and, and uh, um, then look at how, how well it's, uh, it's doing, how well it fits the data. Okay, so here's an example, um, a, a measure of a model of financial health. And so there are five <clears throat> items uh, in this, um, that, that we have uh, data on. Um, the first one is uh, asks, is your income greater than your expenses? Um, do you have a checking account? Do you have a savings account? Uh, do you owe money or basically are you in debt? And then do you have a financial plan? And so what we're positing is that uh, these five items make up um, what are a latent variable called 
financial health. And so um, in doing just a, uh, uh, the factor analysis, we see that our factor loadings here are pretty good for um, the first three questions, uh, but not quite as good for uh, being in debt and having a financial plan. And in fact, um, of, of all the uh, evaluation statistics that we look at, um, the one that's most informative is the reliability index that is actually only 0.4, actually less than that. So we know that right off the bat that uh, we don't have a very good fitting model here um, of these five items with uh, the uh, unobserved financial health variable. So we might look at this and say, well, what if we just did the first three here? Because it seems like maybe these uh, might go uh, better or, or might go together better. And so in, in fact, that's, that's what happens uh, if we just use uh, the income greater than expense. Do you have a checking account? Do you have a savings account? Then it, and then our reliability index, index goes uh, way up to 0.78. Um, our chi-square value is still not uh, non-significant. It is significant. So then we have an issue there. And then the um, other uh, evaluation, the root mean square and the uh, SRMR and the uh, FIT index look all to be perfect, but that might be a problem too because uh, you know, it's like if it's perfect, it may be, you know, the too good to be true uh, sort of uh, issue. But anyway, we can see that we've really incre increased our reliability, even though our model might not be uh, the best fitting model we could we could um, we could get. So uh, when we build a structural equation model, uh, the first thing that we need to do is, of course, propose our model. Um, and um, this is uh, sort of in contrast to exploratory factor analysis where you have no idea what a model might be, but you just do a factor analysis and see what falls out of it or what comes of it. Uh, in structural equation modeling, we're going to do confirmatory factor analysis. That is, we're going to propose a specific model. Um, we're going to first look at our measurement uh, aspect. Uh, we're going to estimate our parameters, uh, our regression coefficients or the uh, factor loadings, uh, the error variances. And then we're going to look at uh, our goodness of fit indices and how well they do. And those are gonna be essentially the same uh, that we looked at before, except that now, instead of looking at the reliability of the measurement model, uh, which we would do anyway, uh, we're going to, for, for the overall structural equation model, we would look at the R squared. And this is comparable to the R squared in a regression uh, model where it tells us um, uh, how much variance in our model uh, or how much variance our model counts for uh, relative to the uh, uh, overall variance. And then based on our goodness of fit, uh, statistics, then we might uh, want to revise our model. So I'm going to use an example here uh, <clears throat> from uh, our teacher well-being study. And so um, the variables, some of the variables here, I haven't listed all of them, um, are uh, burnout, uh, anxiety, depression, uh, job demands, job support, uh, job control, uh, parental support, um, concept of secondary stress, um, risk, how at risk uh, do the uh, teachers feel, uh, and then a concept of resilience. Uh, and then we're going to look at some demographics, age, race, uh, income, experience they've had. Um, LEA, I forget what that actually stands for, but basically it's uh, what type of school you're in, whether it's a public school, a private school, a charter school. Um, and then uh, another concept uh, of economic hardship. And so all of these are going to be observed um, variables. 
And so what we're going to do then is develop a uh, structural equation model. And this is, this is our uh, initial outline of the model that we think uh, we uh, want to uh, want to see if we can if we can uh, if this model fits uh, as well as we'd hope it would. And so our latent construct or our um, uh, latent variable is going to be what we're going to call it te te teacher well-being. Um, and the variables that make up this latent construct construct are depression, anxiety, and burnout. And then primarily we want to see how uh, job demands or demands of the job um, influence uh, teacher well-being. But we think that the individual uh, resilience, um, that is basically how well a person handles stress, uh, is going to uh, moderate the um, impact of job demands. And so we have uh, it diagrammed this way, uh, where demands and, and uh, resilience um, have an have a in, uh, influence on teacher well being. And then we're going to add in uh, different covariates here uh, to see if they impact. Uh, our model. And so here's <clears throat> uh, uh, a model that uh, I just sort of kind of put this together to illustrate um, how, how this is going to look. And so our um, three observed variables here, burnout, depression, and anxiety, um, we're going to say those are teacher well-being or mental health. And obviously, since these are more negative, then that means that uh, the uh, lower the score, the better the mental health, the higher the score, the worse the mental health here, uh, which uh, maybe was, would have been better to uh, redo that. But anyway, um, and, and so then we're going to look at different um, variables here that we think uh, moderated. In this case, we're going to look at uh, we would say parental support um, and would um, influence uh, teacher uh, well-being or, or mental health. And then um, this would indicate that we're looking at interaction between uh, job demands and parental support and secondary stress and, and parental support. And then these are different um, covariates we look at here. And so if we got these kind of statistics for our model here, we would see that we don't have uh, a good model at all. We need to sort of um, basically start over here because our chi-square is significant. The um, root mean square error is pretty high. The um, residual is high. The fit index is low and the R squared is always is kind of low. So by looking at these statistics in combination here, we can see that we don't have um, uh, a, a model that we can, we can use at all. And so we might want to modify this. And so uh, we look at, say we look at uh, parental support here as a mediating variable. Uh, and then look at the impact uh, of job demands and secondary stress on mental health. And again, if we got these kind of statistics here, we could see that, again, we, we don't have a model that's uh, good at all. And in fact, we again would have to abandon this model and, and basically start over. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to look uh, at, um, I think it's five or six different models here that we tried and uh, look at how well um, the, our fit uh, indices uh, do in um, telling, us, telling us whether the model is, is um, any good or not. So here we start with our latent variable of mental health, uh, the three observed variables that we think make up this latent variable. And so these numbers here on the arrows from mental health to the observed variables indicate our factor loadings. And so we can see that those are pretty good and, it, and indeed our 
um, um, measurement model did pretty well. Um, and then so what we're suggesting here, and this is sort of the one thing about uh, structural equation model, you have to kind of really think about where to draw your arrows, otherwise it gets so confusing. <laughs> but anyway, so what we're primarily interested in is the um, impact of demands on mental health. Uh, and so in this case, we can see that uh, demand, job demands have a high impact uh, on mental health. It's moderated some by resilience. And we can see here, there's a negative correlation between demands and resilience. So we're saying there's a demand by resilience interaction uh, because resilience here is moderating uh, the impact of demands. And then uh, we have um, job control, which has very little uh, influence on mental health. Uh, and the same thing with uh, uh, teacher support um, doesn't have much of an influence on, on mental health, even though there's a pretty good correlation between say control and support. Um, but uh, an, it appears that the only one that's really impacting it here is job demands. And then we have <clears throat> our covariates down here that, uh, and, and as we look at the, um, <clears throat> um, the relationships here, we can see that they're almost non-existent. In fact, most of them are actually pretty close to zero. So if we look at the fit, indices for this uh, model, we see that our root mean square is um, uh, about 0.1, which isn't terribly close to 0.05. Uh, our goodness of fit, uh, chi-square, is statistically significant. Uh, the p-value is actually pretty small. Uh, you can see that the chi-square value is nowhere near the degrees of freedom. Uh, 47 versus 16. And our R squared value for this model is 0.64, which is, you know, pretty good. Uh, not real great, but uh, it's, it's not that bad. So we can see that maybe this model needs to be uh, um, revised a bit that we can get uh, a better fit. And so model two here, um, we've uh, taken away uh, our, meet, our moderating variable here, uh, and we put in the uh, a variable called risk, which is you know cor correlated with resilience. Um, and we, if we look at this model now, ag again we're primarily focusing on job demands and its influence on mental health. Uh, the relationship here isn't as strong as our previous model. Uh, we've introduced another variable over here called secondary stress, which obviously has an impact on mental health. And these uh, job demands and secondary stress are pretty highly correlated. Uh, and again, uh, our covariates here of experienced income, black and, um, and school type are, are not, very, not very strong. And then we also inter introduced here a correlation between depression and anxiety, uh, which is uh, fairly fairly high. So for this model, um, we've improved a bit, uh, but um, our uh, root mean square errors is uh, still not 0.05, but it's 0.07, which you know probably isn't too bad. Our goodness of fit is still to just statistically significant, but uh, the chi-square and the um, degrees of freedom uh, are a lot closer than, than the uh, model one. Our FIT index is, is pretty high, 0.96, which is really good. And our R-squared goes all the way from 0.6 before to 0.76. So in terms of uh, a couple of the FIT indices here, primarily the um, fit index and the R squared, uh, we have a really a pretty good model here. 
but we think, well, okay, is there maybe another way of looking at this that would improve the model? So in this case, <clears throat> we've really uh, drastically changed our model where we're looking at, again, resilience here, interacting with job demands. Um, but we've put secondary stress here as uh, one of the variables that uh, makes up the mental health uh, unobserved variable. And so, um, and again, we have our same, our, the same, um, except for, for age, we have experience income in black and LEA as our covariates. Um, and we're not, and we're at this point not suggesting any relationship between these and job demands. So this is a fairly different um, uh, model uh, than before. Uh, but again, job demands has a, a strong impact on mental health, but it is um, moderated by resilience. And so if we look at our uh, fit indices here, um, we really now are, are doing pretty well in terms of the mean square error, um, our chi-square, although 0.05 isn't that different from significance at 05, it's, you know, is, is um, uh, technically not statistically significant. Our fit index is, is high 0.97, but our R squared has dropped back um, to 0 0.6, uh, 0 0.66 now. So um, although some of the uh, fit statistics look a lot better than the previous models, our R squared is not as good as the last one. And so we might uh, redo our model, revise our model again, and so this time um, I've included some of these demographic variables here like experience and income um, as moderating variables now, not just covariates. Um, and then I, at this point I color coded um, the uh, variables and, and uh, the predictor moderators and covariates because it was getting difficult to um, Look at the uh, look at the diagram and sort them all out. But so again, we can see that um, demands has a, a large influence on mental health. It's moderated by resilience, uh, but it's not moderated much by experience or by uh, income. And uh, and then I've added some more correlations here between. Um, our observed variables that make up our uh, latent variable. And you can see that really the only one that's of any uh, size here is the correlation between depression and, and, and anxiety. So <clears throat> looking at our fit statistics here, um, we sort of do uh, even better than uh, the other model, uh, except that our R squared is not um, quite as high, but uh, as it was in model two, but our fit indices uh, are, are really pretty good here in terms of both the goodness of fit, um, the root mean square error and the fit index. And so um, in uh, the next model, model five, um, I've included economic hardship um, as a moderating variable uh, of job demands. And so, uh, although it's getting more and more difficult to <laughs> uh, sort of sort out what's going on here, but again, our uh, job demands um, have a pretty strong influence on our mental health. It's moderated by resilience not so much by experience, uh, a little bit by economic hardship and not so much by income. 
and again, our covariates here of, uh, uh, although um, race here now is actually a moderating variable because I have it linked here to income, uh, which has a rather small uh, negative correlation here. Um, but again, it doesn't have much uh, influence at all on, on mental health. And so in this case, our FIT indices uh, are getting even better. Um, so now we have a chi-square that's clearly not significant. Um, the uh, root mean square is less than 0.05. Again, we have uh, a good FIT index and our R squared in this model is uh, over 0.7. So this model so far is about as good as uh, as we can do in terms of all of the uh, FIT indices, uh, suggesting that we have a pretty good model here. And then I uh, have just one more. We have uh, sort of a small correlation between economic hardship and demands. And so we might think, well, maybe we could take this one out, take, you know, take out the relationship between demands and economic hardship and see what we get, uh, if that improves the model at all. And it turns out that it doesn't. It's uh, virtually identical to the one before. So the only thing that's different between this model and um, the uh, previous one, model five, is that we've taken out this correlation here. So you can see that there's a lot of ways that you can um, change things uh, to get the model to fit. Uh, but again, the important thing is here that uh, demands uh, has a strong impact on mental health. It's moderated by resilience, uh, not, not by income, uh, and uh, a, a small effect of economic hardship and virtually no uh, effect of experience. And then our final model, we uh, uh, took out some of the variables like race uh, and uh, school type, put in age here, uh, and then uh, looked at um, the model uh, again. And the thing that notes here is that our um, impact of job demands on mental health isn't changing much. It's still around point in the high point five. It's being moderated by resilience, uh, not so much by experience, uh, a little bit by economic hardship, uh, and uh, some by age in a negative direction. In, in other words, the older person is, the better the mental health. And our FIT statistics, uh, are, are really pretty good. Our, the only thing here is that um, our R squared goes down a bit from 0.71 to 0.69, which isn't that uh, uh, much. So um, then we, what we have to do is we have to make a decision between, um, uh, between the models. And so, um, Model six here is, is really pretty good in terms of the chi-square fit, uh, the root mean square error, the fit index, and then the R squared is pretty good. It's you know, basically 0.7. So <clears throat> this might be the model we go with, but uh, again, we would uh, need to um, look at the, um, in comparison with the other models, and then we might think, well, maybe Maybe there's a way we can make it even better. Um, we see that here that experience doesn't have much effect. So maybe in our next iteration here, we might want to take out experience and see what, what that does. But you can see that you can kind of um, uh, suggest a lot of different relationships or, or no relationships uh, to uh, get the model to, to fit. Uh, or it, it may turn out that nothing you do makes it fit very well. Okay, and so these are just some of the uh, comments 
I made along the way as, as well as the different models. Um, I can look at those. So <clears throat> I wanted to um, end up here uh, with, the, with the last um, example of a um, structural equation model that's, that turns out to be fairly complex uh, and maybe even too complex to, um, uh, to fit, but we'll see. Um, so this is a study um, in looking at health-related quality of life um, with continuous intravenous inotropic support in stage D heart failure. So stage D heart failure patients are really quite ill. Um, and so um, the variables that uh, they wanna look at here are different treatment options. One of which being is the continuous intravenous uh, support, uh, CIIS. Uh, they can do mechanical support uh, or just symptom management strategies. Um, so this is basically an exploratory um, <clears throat> aim to uh, look at the correlates of laboratory data, physiologic data, and medication therapy to symptom expression severity uh, on uh, health-related quality of life. And so the uh, variables, uh, there's a lot of variables that we want to look at here. Um, Health-related quality of life is um, going, to, going to be based on the Kansas City uh, cardiomyopathy questionnaire, uh, a time trade-off, uh, which um, basically is, lo is looking at, um, you know, how much um, time uh, would you be willing to give up uh, in terms of your life expectancy uh, in relationship to how well uh, you feel. Um, days at home, uh, out of the hospital, activities of daily living, uh, then treatment, treatment satisfaction, uh, treatment burden. Uh, it's measured by a number of things, the number of pick lines. Um, <clears throat> ED visits, hospitalizations, and so on. Uh, then there's laboratory data, there's physiologic data, uh, there's medication data. Uh, and so we're going to try and fit all of these variables into a single model, which, you know, may or may not, you know, work very well, but um, the um, <clears throat> uh, model that's being proposed uh, then looks like this. And so you can see that this is fairly complex model and whether we can actually um, model all of this is, is uh, obviously questionable, but we're going to see um, if, if, it's, if, if we can actually do it. And so you can see that what we have here are six latent variables, the main one being health-related quality of life. Um, but we think that this might be influenced by symptom experience, by a laboratory um, values, by physiologic uh, variables, by the medications that are being taken, and by the patient's perception of treatment burden or satisfaction with treatment. And so these were all of the uh, observed variables that go into making up health-related quality of life the variables that uh, make up treatment burden, medications, and so on. And so you can see here, uh, I've got them numbered that in terms of the uh, lambdas or the factor loadings on the uh, latent variables, we're going to estimate 23 of those. Uh, we have eight different, I think it's eight here, different rec regression coefficients and um, and I think four uh, correlations, uh, correlations between uh, the latent variables. And I haven't indicated any correlations between the uh, observed variables here, um, make the uh, figure almost unreadable. But anyway, so this is an example of how complex you might, uh, of a model you might uh, try to, um, to, to develop. And so um, what we 
what we'll, we'll do is uh, collect all this data on these patients and uh, then see what, um, uh, whether we can uh, develop this model and have a good fit. Uh, and so to do this, you can imagine that we're gonna need a fair amount of patients. So um, probably to do structural equation modeling, you're gonna need it uh, for simpler models, at least a hundred patients. Um, more complex models like these, it's going to be more in the 200 plus uh, patients or subjects to be able to model um, something like this. So um, <clears throat> a couple of comments I want to make. Um, first of all, on the observed variables, if you are measuring things like um, uh, anxiety or, you know, some uh, variable like that, uh, use established surveys or questionnaires with established reliability and validity. Otherwise, you're going to have to establish reliability and validity yourself. In other words, you can't just make up uh, your own questions without uh, testing or, or determining how reliable and valid uh, those, uh, those questions are. So um, and uh, like, uh, for example, quality of life, uh, there's a number of uh, established um, measurement instruments that you can use uh, for that. So if you're doing this sort of um, thing, make sure that you use established uh, instruments. Um, we can also do uh, independent group comparisons uh, of models or, or uh, a, a model with different uh, with different groups. So um, basically, what we what we would do is we're going to compare the parameter estimates and model differences. And so, for example, in our heart failure model, we might want to compare uh, mechanical circulatory support patients with the CIS CIIS patients and see if the model are the same or whether we get a different model. Um, for different uh, groups of patients. And then finally, uh, I just wanted to uh, end up by saying that um, if we have something that's more complicated than just uh, uh, linear regression with a continuous um, outcome, um, we can use what's called generalized structural equation modeling. Uh, and here we can uh, include uh, like repeated measures or mixed effects, uh, we can do time to event uh, analyses. Um, so it's possible to do uh, virtually everything that you can do in, in uh, uh, ordinary regression with uh, structural equation modeling. And the structural equation modeling gives you actually a much um, uh, fuller, or I guess bigger, fuller picture than ordinary regression because it allows you to look at um, correlations between, um, between variables as well as correlations between the latent variables. So a, I got a few references here and then I wanna thank you for your time and I do want to um, extend my apologies for uh, missing um, last Friday's um, a session uh, had uh, some trouble getting on to the webinar and uh, too much time had gone by. <laughs> so we decided to uh, take this sort of uh, tact and, and just record it and send out the recording. So if you have any questions about structural equation modeling, uh, just send me uh, your questions or notes or comments to uh, my um, email address here at, at, uh, at MedStar. So thank you for your time um, and uh, we'll uh, hopefully get back on track uh, in March. <laughs>